we'll go ahead and get started. Again, thank you all for being a part of these Kingdom uh, Family Studies on Tuesday. And as I always mentioned, I hope these are as beneficial to you uh, as they are to me. I pray that we don't just uh, take the studies, uh, hear them, and don't apply them to our lives. I think if we take what God's Word says, uh, we'll be the families uh, that God would have us to be, to represent, to bring glory to His name while we're here on this earth. And I appreciate you know, the input, the feedback, and the encouragement that I get from all of, all of you uh, over the many uh, weeks and months uh, we've been doing these Kingdom Family Studies. Okay, we are in Matthew 5. In just a few moments, I want to talk about humble homes. Uh, but before we get started, I do want to let you know these are being recorded, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to make sure you all check your microphones, uh, that they are muted so we won't get feedback. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask any Bible question you might have about God's Word, even if it doesn't pertain to our subject matter on tonight. Also, I'd like to let everybody know I'm not the master teacher. Uh, we're all here to learn from each other and we'll find out what, what does say the Lord uh, on any subject uh, that we discuss, okay? So we're holding each other accountable because uh, we want to hear God's thoughts and not the thoughts of man. Again, if you're not speaking, go ahead and mute your mics. There will be an opportunity for you to speak and ask any questions and to make comments as well, okay? Uh, we're going to start in Matthew 5 in just a few moments, but before we do, I do want to open up in a word of prayer, and I'm going to impose on Brother Kenny. If you don't mind, Brother, to go ahead and open us up to get us. Let us bow. Our Father God, who art in heaven, Father, we're just so thankful for this opportunity to gather from all across the world, Father, to just be put in position to know what it means to be kingdom-minded. Um, we're just so thankful and grateful for your manservant and his ability to not only set aside personal times, Father, to uh, put us in position to just understand what thus says the Lord concerning various topics, but on today's especially focusing on kingdom marriages. Father, we're so grateful for the representatives that are here. We're just so thankful for their willingness to uh, be in here week in and week out uh, to, to study. Uh, Father, we could have been doing many things tonight. But we're here, Father, because we want to get closer to you. And we want to know how we all can be better husband and better wives so we can continue to edify you, Father. We're so grateful for your son, Jesus, and his sacrifice, Father, that gives us access to the tree of life. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short. But it's because of his willingness to go to the cross Father, we're just so grateful for that sacrifice, and we're so thankful that we have an opportunity to get it right. Father, we're so grateful for your mercy, your grace. We know that tomorrow isn't promised to no one, Father, and you keep waking us up each and every day. So to be on the side of the living, having another opportunity to get it right, is a blessing, Father. We're so grateful for all the wonderful things that you continue to do for us, Father, and the things that you're going to continue to do for us, Father. We're so thankful for the churches across the world, Father, those who continue to preach the word in season and out of season, those who continue to hold fast to the doctrine. To God be the glory, Father, to all the great platforms and things that we have, but for those who continue to use it to edify you, Father. Many of us are here on this call because of messages that we have heard utilizing platforms such as YouTube and, and, and now we utilize, we're utilizing a platform such as Zoom to continue to study. Father, we're just so grateful and we're just so thankful, Father. And we ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kennedy. Wonderful prayer, my brother. God bless you, okay? Now, tonight I want to talk about humble homes and how to have them. I want to begin by reading uh, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And uh, many of you, if you're students of the Bible, you understand that what Jesus is going to uh, say in this Sermon on the Mount is the attitude that those who are going to be in his kingdom must have. I'm going to begin at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain. And, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all men are evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Tonight I want to uh, hone in on the first blessing that Jesus mentions here. Uh, in his sermon on the mount and that is blessed are the poor in spirit he says for theirs is the kingdom of heaven you know brothers when we look at, at families you know from our perspective and the environment that we're in for the most part what comes to mind when we see families that are doing well that are blessed uh maybe not uh, going through uh, trials or tribulations we usually say man that family is is blessed uh because there are some good things going on that we see you know as we stand on the outside looking in. And then when we see other families who may be having hard times and struggling and going through uh, trials and tribulations, we usually use the word, well, man, that family is, is struggling. You know, that's usually what we say. Uh, that family is struggling. And Jesus, I believe, and it's not by coincidence, he uses blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven because it is the attitude that is, I believe, the foundation of everything else that he said in the verses that we just read on today. Because to be poor, brothers and sisters, meaning you understand that you have to depend on someone else to lead you, uh, to support you, to provide for you. Uh, understand that everything that you have, uh, it actually comes from somebody else. And I think what Jesus is trying to get us to see is that's the attitude for those who are in the kingdom of his dear son, that we need to understand that we need God. We must depend on him to lead us, to guide us, to support us, to sustain us. In other words, God is the source of everything that you and I have, okay? And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, understand something. If you're going to, as a poor person, if you're going to survive, if you're going to eat, if you're going to be fed, clothed, housed, uh, what's going to have to be eliminated from that equation for you to live is, is pride. In other words, you're going to have to understand, you're going to have to depend on somebody. That means you're going to have to ask, you're going to have to beg, uh, you're going to have to bow the knee, uh, and, and, and not have a spirit of pride to not want to ask somebody to help you. In other words, you've got to be humble. That's the idea. God wants us to have a spirit of humility, because humility is the foundation of all blessings. It's, it's the foundation if you really want to be happy. You and I have got to understand that I must depend on God. And when you and I stop depending on God, thinking that we do everything on our own, the positions we're in, the authority that we have, that we've got it on our own, here's what kicks in pride, which is the opposite of humility. A simple de definition of pride is simply forgetting about God. I want you to make sure you get that. Pride is simply forgetting about God. Forgetting that God provided you the food. God gave you the clothing. God gave you the position. God gave you the relationship that you and I have. And so when you and I forget about God, that's when pride kicks in. Pride is a family killer. Make sure we get that. It's killing families. Pride, because we don't understand humility, uh, we were not humble, or we, we have a false definition, really, of what humility is. Humility, uh, pride is a cancer, brothers and sisters. It eats up, in many homes, love. Uh, pride is eating up peace. Uh, pride is eating up contentment. Pride, if you're not careful, it, it eats up common sense, you know, because of pride, even when you know something is, is right or wrong, you won't admit it because of pride. And so pride is dangerous. Uh, pride is something that will keep you and I out of heaven. Uh, pride is of the devil. Make sure we get that. It is, it is one of the ways that all of us, uh, if not careful, we have fallen into the sin. It's how the devil works. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Every sin that any of us have ever done has come from one of those three ways. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. Let me tell you why pride is dangerous. 
because pride, brothers and sisters, it seems everybody else is lost but my own. Go to Luke 18. I want you to go there. I want to talk about, you know, the opposite of humility, and I think this is going to help us understand what humility is. Go to Luke chapter 18. Pride is dangerous because, and deceptive because it can spot everybody else who has it but yourself, you know, if you're, if you're not careful. That's how deceptive it is. A pride will tell you or make you think that, that you're good enough, that, that you don't need anybody, need anything, uh, that you are the source of your strength, authority, and your own power. That's what pride tells you. In Luke chapter 18 and verse number 9, Jesus gives uh, here a parable of the Pharisee and the public. And I want you to read this with me in Luke 18 and verse 9. And he spake this parable in a certain which trusted in themselves. You see that? Trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despise others. That's what pride does. It despises everybody else. That's what it does. It doesn't see its own fault, but it can see everybody else's wrongs and everybody else's wrongs. And so Jesus says, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. Extortioner, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. Look how religious he is. I give tithes of all that I possess. So he's so religious, he's so holy, he's so into himself, he doesn't see that he needs God. And so he, he looks at the public and he knows the publican though, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes under him, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful. Go to me a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone, what is this? It's what pride does. Exalts himself, shall be a base, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Okay? So that's pride. When you exalt yourself, you're lifting yourself up. When you, when you think you don't need God, that your own righteousness is what got you. I knew where you are, pride. Now, I thought this was a kingdom family study. Well, it is. Because as I mentioned, you know, pride is destroying all uh, Because I believe, for the most part, we don't understand humility. And so what we want to do tonight is we want to look at the biblical definition of humility. Brothers, this is one of the things that, that I, and again, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, that I think we need to start doing is going back and taking back what the world has stole from us in the kingdom. You know, God's his son. A lot of things that we have been taught, we've let the world define what truth is on certain words. A lot of us, we talk like the world. We, we have worldly definitions, and we take in worldly definitions, worldly concepts, and we bring them into the church. And I think humility is one of the, the things that we've allowed the world to rob us of in the church, understanding what it is. So let's talk about what it is tonight and learn what it is from Jesus himself. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Jesus is going to teach us, brothers and sisters, about humility. And while you turn to Philippians chapter 2, again, I'm going to say this. If you and I don't have a spirit of humility, we're not making it into heaven. If you're not humble in your home and your family, you're not making it into heaven. We've got to get and understand God's definition of humility, brothers and sisters, or we are not getting in. You're not getting in. I'm not getting in. Now, Philippians chapter 2, Paul is writing to Christians, and I want to commence the reading at verse number 3. Philippians 2 and verse number 3. Paul says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let not every man, or uh, look not every man rather, on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, if this, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven 
and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus here teaches us as 100% God and as 100% man of what humility is, how to be humble and what humble people do. Now, let's define humility. Let me tell you what humility is, brothers and sisters. And I said this on yesterday, which is what which is what spurned or birthed this subject because we are studying Luke. Uh, chapter 14 on yesterday talking about discipleship and, and how we have to have a spirit of humility and this is what I said man we need to talk about humility a lot because it, it is something that's misunderstood humility brothers and sisters is not thinking less of yourself I'm going to say that again you're not humble just because you think less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less that's what Jesus did make sure you get that it's not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less. Make sure you have, write that down. I want to make sure you get that. I don't want us to just hear it. I want you and I to study this. It's not thinking of yourself less. It, 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 it's, it's, it's thinking of yourself less. Now, everybody with me on that? What he's saying, see, what Jesus still is 100% God. He's a hundred percent God when he comes. He never denies who he is when he comes to this earth. See, a lot of us have been taught, well, humility is, you know, what you have to do is you have to you have to be a doormat. You have to be passive. Uh, you, you have to deny your accolades. You can't have anything. You it, you know, you can't admit that, that you're good in a certain area of your life because if you admit you're good, then, then, then you're not humble. That's not what humility is. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's putting others first. That's what it is. It's thinking about other people. Using your position. Using your gifts. That God has given you to glorify God. That's what it is. Jesus never. Remember. Anybody in here think on oh, this one, Think that Jesus has pride. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father but by me. Raise your hand if you think Jesus was prideful when he was telling anybody. Raise your hand so we can talk to you. That's what I thought. So he didn't deny who he was. Humility doesn't mean you have to deny your gifts. Deny who you are. It's taking what you have. Taking your position taking who you are and using it to glorify God. That's what humility is. Helping somebody else. See, the world, I don't tell you, doesn't teach humility as a good thing. The world teaches a bad thing. You know, most people who got jobs, when they do, when they, when they start gauging you whether or not you should get a promotion or whatever job you're in, you know, how many of you have seen on your promotion that the reason you got the promotion is because you were humble? You don't know, really, yeah, you don't see that anymore. I mean, the closest I think we get to humble in our secular society is, oh, he's a team player, or she's a team player. And, and, and they, they, they really tell that, that definition too. I mean, but, but the idea is humility is something that, that in our society, this culture is, is, is looked down upon because our world is get it, go get it, get to the top, elbow your way to it, get what you want so you can take care of you. And many of us have taken that mentality and we bring it into our homes and it's the same mentality that's brought into the church. And I'm going to tell you, we will not make it to heaven with that mentality. Go to Matthew chapter 2. When he see, I'm just thinking while I'm talking to y'all, Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to try to get to this as quickly as I can, but I want you to look at something here. Matthew 20, it was, it was the problem that the disciples had that uh, Jesus was with for three years. You know, they were always wrestling about who's the greatest in the kingdom. See, we have to understand the greatest in the kingdom is those who understand that everything I got came from God. Every position I have come from God, and I need to use that position, that authority that God has given me to serve. That's it. So that God can get glory. So in Matthew chapter 20, you remember the disciples, they, this is all they thought about because they didn't understand the kingdom. They were looking for a worldly kingdom. They had a, a worldly mindset. 
And toward Matthew chapter 20, let me see where I want to pick up here just real quick. I want to read all this because I got uh, four points I definitely want to give you. In Matthew 20, I'm going to start in verse 20. Let me give you the context here. Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about a spiritual kingdom. And what's going to happen here is you're going to have... Uh, uh, you're gonna have a helicopter mom, you know, helicopter mom, you know, a mother that just comes in and wants the best for their children, helicopter mom. So, Jesus has been teaching, he got uh, uh, this mom that's gonna come in and she's concerned about her boys. Now, look what happened in verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What will thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on the right hand, the other on the left in your kingdom. Now here she go. You know, it's, it's, it's a PTA meeting. Uh, let's have a parent-teacher meeting. You know, you're the teacher, I'm the parent. This is what I want for my children. Okay, this is what I want. I want them to have the best in, in life. Okay, that's what she wants. But Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Are you even to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized in the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said unto him, we are able. He said unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, now look at this, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. Now they mad. Now if you keep in score, this is John and Jane's mother. Okay, if you want to keep score, he doesn't tell us who that, but James and John's mom came and asked Jesus for this meeting. Now, the other 10 is getting, now, why they mad? I mean, if, if you ask me why I think they mad, it's because they didn't ask first. Yeah, I think they, they didn't think of it first. That's why they mad. But Jesus called them unto him and said, you know not the princes of the Gentiles. Now, those are you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are great. They that are great exercise authority upon them. Now, look at verse 26. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you will be your minister. What are you saying, Jesus? The greatest in the kingdom is he who's going to serve. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. See, that's a different mindset than what the world teaches. People want help all their way to the top, but it's not so that they can glorify God or so that they, they will be concerned about others. They're concerned about themselves. Jesus said it should not be in this kingdom. You've got to change your mindset. This is a kingdom of humility. And so you read in your own legion, John chapter 13. This is why Jesus knows exactly who he is. He's Lord and he's master. He knows he's going to go to the Father when you read John 13. And what does he do in John 13? He moves himself from the table after taking the supper, takes a towel, girds it around himself, and he washes his feet. That's what he said. And he tells the disciples, you don't understand what I'm doing, but I hope you'll get it. I serve. I know who I am. I know where I came from. And my job is to serve. You go and do likewise. That's what he wants us to do. You know what that takes? Humility. Jesus shows us what humility is, okay? We've got to get out of this mindset, brothers and sisters, of this thinking Humility is this false modesty, and we're good at that. Oh, I don't talk about my gifts and my talents. I don't talk about my accolades and the wisdom that God has given me. That's, that's false modesty. That's not humility. That is not humility for you to not talk about and, and, and appreciate your, your gifts and your talents and what, what God has done for you and what God has given you. And we got to be careful in the church because a lot of us will start trying to hold other people down who may have gifts and talents and, and they want to use them, but because they have a false definition of humility, you start tearing other people down. You shouldn't do this. You can't do this. You shouldn't be over here. You can't do that. That's not humility. Humility is simply putting other people first. I'm putting other people's needs, other people's wants, priorities. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna do God's will and I want God to be glorified. That's what, that's humility. Go to 1 John, John chapter three. Go to 1 John chapter three. Real quick, 1 John 3, 14 and 15. 1 John 3, 14 and 15. That's what God expects us to do, brothers and sisters. He don't want you to be denied your gift. No, you, 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 you appreciate the gift. The talents that God has and you use them. And you, you use them to glorify God. If God has blessed you, you be a blessing. 
That's what you and I do in your home and, and, and wherever you are. First John 3, 14 and 15. Listen to what he said. It's about love and action. John says in First John 3, 14, we know that we have passed uh, from death unto life because we love the brother. He that loveth not his brother abided in death. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer had eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. For whoso had this world's good. And see his brother that have me. And shut up his bowels of compassion from him. He asks a question. How does the love of God dwell in him? This is why Jesus says, and it's quoted by Luke in Acts 20 and 35. You won't find this statement of Jesus in the Gospels. It is more blessed to give than receive. That's not in the Gospels. It's actually Luke recorded it. Jesus said it in Acts 20 and 35. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. See, the more we give what God has given us, the more grace and, and that, that God will give us. See, we have to see that God has given you and I grace. I often give the same thing who's created an acronym for grace, G-R-A-C-E. And this is what the Father did for us. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. What the Father did is he gave his son. He gave his son. He gave us grace at the expense of Jesus, sent his only begotten son. And what Jesus in turn did is what Jesus did is he gave his life so that you and I can make heaven our home and be reconciled to the Father. But he never denied who he was, brothers and sisters. He never denied who he was. Never. And so by his action, he showed humility. So real quick, how do we get to humble? How do we get to humble? There's some things we need to know. Number one, number one, it is as much an intention as a position. I'm going to say it again. We need to know that humility is as, as much intention as it is a position. And again, as I already said, don't mean you have to give up your job title, your position. Many of us, I wonder how many of us, when you read Daniel 6, 1 and 2, do y'all know Daniel was made a president? He was made a president in a Babylonian world. I'm afraid many of us today will tell Daniel, man, if you're going to be a godly man, you can't be a president. Who said that? Who teaches that? You can't be a pre president. But what Daniel did in the position is he glorified God. And so you're not humble because you give up a position, a job title. You use the abilities and the talents that God has given you to bring glory to God. Okay? Now, I'm make sure we get that. Serve in the position. As long as the position that you're seeking after is not sinful, it's not causing you to sin, you can glorify a God in it, you be humble. You serve. That's what you do. You bring glory to God. Okay? And so, what are you saying? Well, I'm a father. That's what I am. I'm a father help. God has put me in that position. And what I need to do is I need to serve. That's what I do. If you're a father on here, a mother, if you're a parent, God has given you that position. And what you ought to do in those positions is we ought to glorify God. That's what you do. You don't stop being a father or stop being a mother. Just have to say, I'm being humble. No, you use the power and the position to glorify God. You intentionally serve God with that position, okay? Submit your position to the purpose of God and bless other people. Be a blessing. You know, our, our families, if you're a member of the church, brothers and sisters, our families is supposed to rest, represent the image of Christ. That's what it represents. We represent an image of unity, of oneness, of reconciliation. And I'm going to tell you, if pride gets in there, it's going to destroy your home. It's going to divide your home. That's what it does if you got pride. Number two, number two, number two, how do we get to humble? How do we get to humility? Well, it's about how we approach other people. It, it's about denying ourselves for others' good or for others' best interests. Now, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. In our home, we need to learn to step back and see where our husband and our wife and our children, where are they coming from? 
The reason we're having so many problems in kingdom families is because we got too many husbands, too many wives who are in competition with each other. I'm going to tell you, that's what's going on. You're comparing each other with each other. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Forgive me, 2 Corinthians 10. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to have a happy home if you and your wife and uh, is in competition with each other you know, about the gifts and the talents and the power and the authority that God has given. Y'all need to be working together. Comparing each other with each other is going to bring in pride. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be fussing and fighting. And, and, and man, I'm going to tell you, and, and until death do your part. Second Corinthians 10 and verse number 12. Paul is writing to Christians. And know what he says in verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number. Or, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves. And comparing themselves among themselves. He says it's not wise. And it's not. Let me say this. Brothers and sisters. You, know, you and I are going to be humble. Here's what we have to do. This is what's going to keep you and me humble. When I start comparing myself to Jesus, you know why that'll keep me humble? Because I always come up short. I always need Him to make me perfect, complete. I'm not, why am I? Why would I compare myself to you? You're not even perfect. Why would you compare yourself to me? I'm not perfect. Everything I got comes from Jesus. I need Jesus. So. You and I are not the measuring stick. My wife's not the measuring stick. Your husband's not the measuring stick. God, Jesus is the measuring stick. And when you and I see Jesus as the measuring stick, you'll say, man, you know what? I need forgiveness. So when my wife or my husband mess up, I'm going to show forgiveness because I needed it from him. <clears throat> and that'll keep pride out of your home and out of your life, brothers and sisters. That's what it does. See, pride, I'm tell you, brother, it's a, it's a killer. But I'm going to tell you, we, got, we, we serve a God because he loves us. If, you're, if he loves us, he knows how to humble you. He knows how to humble you. If you don't believe me, just go ask Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. You read it in your own leisure, Daniel chapter 4, 28 to 33. Write it down. Go read it. How he was lifted up with pride. And God had him for seven years living like an animal in a field. And then he figured out, yeah, you know what? God is serious about this pride stuff. He knows how to abase those who exalt themselves. So it's about how we approach other people, brothers and sisters. Number three, we get to humble, and when we, we, we get to it when it's seen in action. It's an action more than it's emotion. Let me say it again. It's seen in action, and it's more than an emotion when we talk about humility. It's not what we feel, it's what we do. Remember Philippians 2, 5? Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It's a mindset. So Jesus had a mindset. That's what he did. A mindset. And when he had the mindset, he did something with the mindset. He said, I know who I am. But Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was his mindset? Well, I know I'm the son of God, but I'm a, I want to obey my my father, do my father's will. And so I'm going to take what God the Father have given me, and I'm going to use it to glorify God. I'm going to do something with it. So he emptied himself, made himself of no reputation. He was still 100% God, 100% man. But what he did is he did something once he had the mindset. He humbled himself. That's what he did under the mighty hand of his father. That's why when he gets in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That has to be our mindset, brothers and sisters. I want to do things to help other people that are created in the image of God. That's what God wants from all of us. That would include your wife, your husband, your children. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to say this. If nobody else ought to know that you're humble. If nobody else ought to know that you're a man or a woman of God, it ought to be your family. They ought to know. Too many of us, we want to go to the church building, want to lead in worship, want to lead prayers, want to work around the building, but you're not, your family looking at you like, boy, why don't you sit down somewhere? Who asked him to pray? 
A main one saying amen. Your family needs to know that you are real and humble. You have a relationship with God if nobody else. I can be up there preaching all day long, sweating out shirts all day long. Y'all can come talk to my wife and children. That's who you ought to talk to. Is he really real? Is he re is, is he really serious? And vice versa. People you work with, they ought to know. I'm going to tell you something. Noah preached 120 years, brothers and sisters. Nobody got on that boat but his family. That's who got on his family. So stop trying to reach everybody else, trying to make everybody else in. If you're humble, uh, going to church and talking about God at work, and then your wife and your kids and your husband that don't know it, brother, it's hypocrisy. I'm going to tell you, and God, God's going to handle us. Last thing, and I'm done. Fourthly, humility is relation. Okay? It's relation. Okay? And what I mean by that, humility, brothers and sisters, is how we connect to other people. To be humble, it means you're gonna, you want to be loyal to people. You know, brothers, when we're loyal and people can see our loyalty, then it will cause them to want to be loyal. When you start serving, God gives glory. God blesses you more so that you can be a blessing. People will want to serve you. When you and I understand humility, your wife will, will respect her position and her role because she sees your humility. Your husband, as if you're a wife, will respect you and, and his role when they see that they're being humble. You see, that's how it works. Loyal, being loyal in your relationship. Okay, we have to be. We have to be loyal. It's how we connect. It's how we connect to. It's how we connect to God. It's really how we connect to God. You go to one more script. Go to Second Corinthians twelve. God wants us to be humble, brothers and sisters. He He wants to make sure that that we never are lifted up with pride. Okay, never never have pride. Pride will keep us out of heaven. Remember the Apostle Paul in Second Corinthians chapter twelve. When we look at this. Paul is writing to the saints in Corinth, and Paul has let them know because they were boasting in other people. They thought of Paul, you know, he wasn't an eloquent speaker. Some of them were saying that he wasn't even an apostle. And so Paul had mentioned to them, hey, I'm very much an apostle. You know, and he, he proves that he's an apostle by the work that he's done. He starts talking to them in 2 Corinthians 12 about how he knew a man uh, that was called up into the third heaven where the out of the body in the body he could not tell. He was actually talking about himself. That's what he was doing. Uh, but but I want you to notice what he says in verse number six of uh, Second Corinthians seven verse six. He says, "For though I would desire the glory, he says I should not be a fool. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he heard me to be, or that he heareth of me." Now look what he said. Verse seven. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Because remember, he had, he's all those revelations. He had a chance to be in the third, see things in the third heaven that he could not even utter. He said, so because he saw that, he said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, why would God allow this thorn to be in Paul's flesh that came from Satan? Paul understood something. God allowed this to happen to me as an apostle, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, this is a God says, I'm going to keep this thorn in your flesh, Paul. You've seen some things that other people couldn't see. I know you prayed three times for it to be removed, but you need this, why? To keep you humble. So even an apostle, if not careful, could be lifted up with pride. And, and Jesus didn't want that to happen to him. So he made sure he kept this thorn in his flesh. And so Paul said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul's attitude was, most gladly, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, he says, then am I strong. Okay? And so humility, brothers and sisters, is how we connect to God. Okay? If you're not humble, I'm not humble. It's going to hurt your relationship with God. And you and I will not make it to heaven. So all I'm saying tonight is don't diminish yourself, brothers and sisters. Don't diminish yourself under the guise of humility. Use your position where you are, what you can accomplish in this world, to bring glory to God. Humbly use that position. Use your talents. Use your gifts. 
in whatever position you are, as long as it's not sinful, to bring glory to God. And that's what you should do as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a wife, as a child. <clears throat> Use it humbly. Do something with it and serve. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, thank you so much, Father, for your word which guides us in all truth. Pray, Father, that we have humble homes. A homes, Father, where we serve one another, that whatever we do, eat or drink, that, Father, we do it all to the glory of God. Help us uh, uh, condemn sin to men of low estate. Uh, help us, Father, to understand that everything that we have comes from you. Help us to realize, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, for theirs are the kingdom of heaven. And, Father, if we faltered in these areas where we have had a false definition, understanding of what uh, humility is and was. Father, forgive us if we've hurt anyone, hindered anybody, uh, got to the point to where we thought we could judge people's hearts. Forgive us, dear God, because... We could never judge anybody's heart. We just judge fruit. You're the judge of hearts. Help us, dear God, to treat our wives, our husbands, our children, our families, Father, the way that they're supposed to be treated. Father, by keeping our eye on your son, Jesus, who died that we might live. And it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This time I'm going to open it up for any Bible questions, even if it doesn't pertain to this subject, brothers and sisters. Any questions or comments at this time? I got a question. Okay, go ahead, Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any validity or any truth behind, okay, because I, I feel like right now the world we're like in this um, era where people are like deep into astrology and um, crystals and all that witchcraft stuff. But in particular, people are really into zodiac signs. And that's been something of this world for a very long time. And you know, when you examine it, when you look at it and stuff, it seems like there's some truth, there's some type of consistency with it. Um, I wanna know like what, is there any truth behind that? Like what would the Bible say in regard to zodiac signs and things of that nature? I mean, it's it, it, you're talking about uh, astrology, uh, then, and yeah, that, that's simple. Go to Galatians five. I mean, if you're talking about <laughs> palm reading, tarot cards, that that's simple. Uh, uh, mediums, uh, necromancers. The Bible talks about, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's sinful. Trying to talk to the dead, yeah, that's that's witchcraft. It, it's real. And the devil is real. There are evil spirits uh, out here, but that is not anything that that you and I, as Christians, should be delving into. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Galatians five may there may be a word we might miss in Galatians five that we need to take heed to when Paul talks about the works of the flesh. Uh, in Galatians chapter five and verse nineteen, he says, "Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these." Now here's what we often talk about, which is good. We need to talk about adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, you know, these sexual sins. But then he says, look at verse 20, idolatry, and then he uses a word here, witchcraft. Y'all see that? Witchcraft, that's real. You know, what Simon the Sorcerer was doing was real. You know, uh, there, there's a, we can't believe that there's a Jesus and a Holy Spirit and not believe that there's a demonic spirit, you know, that, that are out there, demons. Uh, that, that are out there. And that not, ought not be anything you and I be trying to study the stars to determine our future. Uh, you know, again, you read your horoscope. I'm going to tell you something. If you're reading your horoscope and believing, you're having faith in it and what it says and living based upon what your horoscope says, you have a problem with God. Amen. There are many people that's going to find themselves in hell because instead of grabbing their Bible, trusting God, they grab in the newspaper or a horoscope to find out how their day is going to go and how their future is going to be. So, yeah, there's some validity to it, and it, it'll be something that Christians stay away from. All right? I hope that helped. Uh, uh, go ahead, iPhone. Hey, brother, that's me, David Black. Hey, good, good question, though. I, I know people follow that uh you know, with the, the zodiac sign and things, and it shows a good question. My question is, uh, what what does it mean when it says blessed? 
fear, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, the kingdom comes down from it comes down from heaven. He's talking about the church, the spiritual kingdom of heaven. And so remember, these are called the beatitudes, and so it's called the beatitudes because this is how your attitude has to be if you're going to make it to heaven. If you and I are going to make it to that everlasting kingdom, go to Second Peter one. Second Peter chapter one. See, if you obey the gospel, you're already in the kingdom spiritually. You've been translated into the kingdom. But I'll show you this. Let's, let's go to Second Peter one first. Let's see. If you obey the gospel, you're in the kingdom. Second Peter chapter one. We'll get here real quick. Uh, there's a everlasting kingdom that all of us are waiting to get into. Even those who have gone on after we've been judged. Uh, by the Lord. Look what uh, verse 9, 2 Peter 1 and verse number 9. See, what Peter has been talking about, for those who are Christians, how we ought to be adding to our faith. Again, it's not one saved, always saved, brother. So this is why the gospel is not just hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I want to, I hope we all get that. All of God's word and what we should do to get baptized to be saved and after baptism is all the good news. What you need to do to get saved and stay saved. So we need to be adding to our faith, all of us. We need to be striving to get closer to Jesus every single day, like Brother uh, Kennedy's prayer. And we're still here. I mean, we all got work to do. If you're still here, I'm still here. We got work to do. We got some things we need to keep working out on soul salvation. So 2 Peter 1, 9, but Paul, so Peter said, but he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, have forgotten that he was first from his own sins. Wherefore, for the rather, brother, give diligence, to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So remember, when Jesus comes back, whenever the Father sends him back, that's going to be judgment day. There's going to be a separation between the, there's going to be sheep and goats. The sheep on the right, goats on the left, he's going to throw the goats into hell, and he's going to take hell, throw it into the into Gehenna, which is the second death. But the sheep is going to enter into this everlasting kingdom. There'll be no liars, uh, no fornicators, no adulterers. Anybody who won't receive God's mercy will enter into that everlasting kingdom. But now, if you've obeyed the gospel, you're already in the kingdom. But you have to remain faithful. Colossians 1, 13, 12 and 13. Paul, in Colossians 1, 12 and verse number 13, says this. Colossians 1, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Paul is writing to Christians. And Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in, in life, who had delivered us, Paul says, Colossians 1.13. He has delivered, already delivered us, Paul said, from the power of darkness. So if you're a Christian, you've been delivered and have translated us, where he translated us into, the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom of his dear son, the, the people of God, the church of Christ. So if you're a member of the church spiritually, you are seated in heavenly places. You're in the kingdom. But you get in that kingdom and stay in that kingdom by having the right attitude. We must continue to depend on God for strength, for mercy, for grace, how to treat our neighbors, how to treat our families. And so if we do that, then we'll enter into that everlasting kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Brother Black, did that answer the question? Uh, I believe so. I just wanted to, I, I, I was following you, you kind of fast, I'm not going to lie. I do, I do, I told you. Uh, I told you. Uh, so, by, by the Bible saying you're being poor in spirit, does that mean inconsistent, lukewarm Christian? That that was more so the, what I, it made me, it, it jumped it to me. Now, so. No, not, not, not lukewarm. Um, when he said. I said say lukewarm Christian, like, hey, you know, have these. Like me, for instance, I feel like I have these. I'm, I'm like this, and 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 that's not. I don't. That's not what I want. Yeah, but uh, but that's that. That's what he wants you to have. You know, we need God's spirit to <clears throat> and God's graces, brothers and sisters, um, to help us to get where God wants us to be. God knows every one of our souls, brothers and sisters. He knows what every one of us need. God will allow you to go through something, you to have something, put you in a position somewhere for the purpose of developing you and those that he put in your vicinity. 
So when you and I have those moments where you, I don't know if you're, when you're saying a roller coaster, you know, life is a roller coaster. There's ups and downs. But in the valleys and on the mountaintops, the, the, the thought is God wants us to know, are you keeping your eye on the Lord? Or, 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 or do you understand that you need God to provide for you? Are you willing to carry your cross? Are you willing to do the right thing even when it's tough? When you fall and you fall short, do you go to God like David and ask God to forgive you? See, that, that's the idea. That's, that's a person that's poor in spirit. I need God to always help me. Brothers, we can never and should never go through life, not one day, thinking that we don't need God. That's poor in spirit. When I wake up, Thank you, David. I wake up, man, I'm poor. God, you woke me up. I can't wake myself up. Lord, if it's your will, I'll wake up tomorrow because I'm poor. Can't give myself up. I need you. We depend on God totally. So as we navigate ourselves through life, he's saying stay poor in spirit. Do the right thing. <clears throat> control yourself. Act the right way. Live a life that just wants to bring glory to God. Okay? I hope that helps. Uh, Brother Coffee. Uh, yes. I, you know, early on, I know this is... Uh, repetitive, but I, I struggle with you know verse three as the brother just just acts again. But as I looked at the rest of the, when I began to understand what that poor meant, but when you look at the rest of of the other beatitudes, you know it takes a humble spirit in order to achieve all of what is going on between four um, and and eleven. But yet when we talk about someone that's poor in spirit, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are. You know, this I'm just going to say this like a financial poor, but it's talking about the humility an individual has. So when you look at a a person that we can, you know, identify physically, and they just don't seem to have it all together, they usually will have a poor spirit. They will usually be humble in a way in which they can be approachable. And and so when we look at it from a spiritual perspective, I just look at it from the standpoint of. It's not talking about money, but it's talking about the attitude that we need to have in order to satisfy God being a Christian. It's almost the same comparison when he was talking about the child, when he brought the child, had that childlike mindset or mentality. And so that, that's how I looked at when he, when I saw that word poor, because I struggled a long time to try to understand that concept. But I'm just looking at it as one of, of humility and understanding that was and that's how Christ went about doing his work with humility. I, I don't want to keep continuing on, but that's just my, my comment. Yeah. yeah, the idea is Revelation 3, the church in Laodicea. Jesus says this to them. See, if you think you've got everything, got it going on without God, brothers and sisters, that's a problem. See, when you bring up lukewarm, listen to this, and this is what uh, David brought up in verse 15 of Revelation 3. Jesus, I know your works, that you need the cold nor high. I would that you were cold or high. So then because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. See, these are, these are people who are straddling the fence. You know, one minute on God's side, one minute not thinking about God. That, 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 he said, because you say, now those are their attitude is, because you say I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Notice what they're saying here. And no, it's not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now this is, even... Even though they have a lot of stuff physically, what Jesus says, this is where you are spiritually. You know, you have to understand something. Your soul is lost, but you think you're rich. So what is he going to tell I counsel you to buy of me. Come to me for what's really gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich. He's talking about making sure spiritual and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eyes out, that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke and shake. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay? So a poor spirit is one that recognizes when they're wrong, repent, and they get it right. I need God to make me perfect. Oh. Uh, Sister Alexander. Hey, so I have a question about um, purpose. So, like, if our purpose on earth is to basically, like, do the will of God and you know, give thanks to him, praise him, all that stuff. Then where does this idea of like a bigger purpose, like you hear people say, oh, I just need to find my purpose or I need to, or my purpose in life has always been to do X, Y, Z. Like, where does that idea come from? Is it just like 
selfish ambition or desire or can like two things exist at once can we be here to um you know give thanks to god and like do his will but then is there also like does everyone have like an individual bigger purpose for their lives if that makes sense no, that makes sense no uh romans eight twenty eight. i want to go there everybody god makes no mistakes i think we all understand. i don't care how you came into this world illegitimately legitimately uh we need to make sure we tell our children this as well you are important uh this world is a better place with you in it i think we need to start stressing that and you need to make sure you tell your children that because one of the things the devil will do is he'll put in people's mind that you're not important uh, God doesn't love you, and, and he takes away your purpose for living. When you don't understand, brothers and sisters, your purpose, then you lose hope. See, we have to understand our purpose in life, and Solomon got this right, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. We talked on these kingdom families before. If you just want to have kids just for ha having kids, it should look like you then you still miss the purpose. Nothing wrong with having kids. You, you want kids, but you have to understand, God gives life. And what you want to do is you want to raise those kids, teach them kids, as, as Paul says, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Train them up in the way that they should go. In other words, every human is created in the image of God. That's why every soul is important, brothers and sisters. Whether you're in the church or out of the church, we've got to love people and serve people. We treat people right and serve people so that they can see God in us. Every soul is important. Every one of them is important. And we want to let them see Christ in us and tell them what the purpose of life is. And the purpose of life is to glorify God. Romans 8 28 and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to to his purpose for whom he did for no he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son you know what he's saying the father sent his son so that you and i that's why i said this earlier he needs to be the measuring stick his son i'm not the measuring stick you're not the measuring stick jesus is and so we should be conforming our lives to his image I want to act like Jesus act. I want to forgive like Jesus forgives. I want to give mercy like Jesus uh, forgives and gives mercy. That should be my attitude. And so we're to be confirmed that he might be the firstborn among, among many among many brethren. And so as long as you understand, first and foremost, that your purpose in life and my purpose in life is to glorify God, then you can ask God and have a desire to be in different positions, to do a different job, uh, but you want to use the talents and the positions and the ability that you're able to do to glorify God. See, that's what Pilate messed up, brothers and sisters, in John chapter 19 and 10. And Jesus set him straight. Well, he said, don't you know I have the power? To, he said, I have the power to kill you or to release you. What did Jesus tell him? You have no power. You have none unless my father gave it to you. That's it. Unless my father gave you that power, that position, you wouldn't be there. And that's how I have to see my position as a husband, as a, as, a, as a father, as if you're a boss, as a boss. You won't have any position unless the Lord gave it to you. And so our purpose in life and whatever we desire and whatever position we're seeking after, whatever stuff we desire, it's got to be first, Lord, to glorify you, not to consume it on yourself. One more scripture on this, Ephesians 4.25. You know that's why you and I should go to work every day? You know, that's why you should work, not just to consume stuff on yourself so you can have a bigger house, a bigger, more cars, more money in the bank. Nah, you're missing your purpose. And that's why many people aren't happy. I'm going to tell you, that's why many homes aren't happy. Because we don't understand your purpose and my purpose is to do the will of God. That's your ultimate purpose. And everything else is secondary. Now, in verse number 20, 28, Ephesians 4, 28, Paul says, let him that stole still no more but rather let him labor working with his hands the things which is good now why why do you need to work 
that he may have to give to him that need it. You see that? It's about, hey, I'm going to give, but not to hoard, but I can give. Okay? All right. Uh, uh, I hope that helped us, Sister Alexandra. Uh, I think it was Sister Vera and then Brother Kennedy and Brother Javier. Go ahead, Sister Williams. Vera? This question is, is what you had said earlier. Yeah, um, as a Christian, is it a do you do you uh, judge people as a Christian? I don't think so. Yeah, you judge. Uh, J John seven twenty four. Yeah, we are the judge. Uh, now you don't judge hearts. I can't judge anybody's heart. What we judge is the fruit. And so if, if I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing, if I'm cursing, let me ask you something, Sister Vera. If I'm cursing, would you tell me I shouldn't curse? Around me, yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And, 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 and would you tell me if I continue to curse and, and don't repent that I'll die lost? Would you tell me that? No. You wouldn't? Well, you should. You should. No, no. I'm, I'm learning. That's okay. Yeah, because I should, though, because you, you understand that if I practice sin and I die in my sin, sister, I can't go to heaven. And so you're making a judgment, but it's a righteous judgment. That's my point. John 7, 24. Well, we are the judge, but we need to make righteous judgment. We don't judge according to fear, but you make a righteous judgment. And, and God's word is the measuring stick. Only, I, I say this all the time. The only time people have problems with judging is when you're condemning their sin. If I said, ooh, Sister Vera, man, that was a great cake you made. Boy, that cake was so beautiful, good, moist. That's a judgment. Man, it was good. You're the best cake maker. You got the blue ribbon. You have no problem with that judgment. No problem at all. Oh, yeah. If, I, if we go to a funeral and say, everybody's going to heaven, nobody has a problem with that. Nobody gets mad when you go to a funeral and say, yeah, so-and-so on his way to heaven teaching the angels how to love. Nobody has a problem. Nobody says, God, put it in heaven. I've never heard anybody say that. Nobody ever says that. I've never heard that at one funeral that stopped putting him in heaven. I hadn't heard it. But if you start saying, hey, he didn't repent. Man, that dude, man, he look like, man, he cheating on his wife. And, and or she was cheating on her husband, man, beating his kids. Man, he ain't making it in, man. If he, had, oh, he won't make it in if he didn't repent. Now that, that people got they mad at you. So John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment, okay? And so, yeah, we are to judge, okay? We are to make judgments, all right and wrong. We judge fruit, not hearts. Okay, uh, Brother Gilbert. Uh, yes, uh, good lesson tonight. Um, I just I just had two uh, two comments. I think this one was for uh, the previous sister. Um, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it tells us that whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And, and you know, we, you know, oftentimes, you know, we always act for promotions and we want things in this life. And, you know, when you get an opportunity to 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 display, especially when people are, are present, you know, sometimes we often forget, you know, the person we pray into and, and, and who we've been asking of all these things and, and, and never, never go and say, man, to God be the glory. I thank God, you know, first and foremost for for giving me this or allowing me or putting me in position. We, we, we forget that. So, you know, it's just, it's just being able to glorify God in, in anything that you can do um, and, and then putting it on display so that way people can see the God in you. Um, and, and, and sometimes little stuff like that, the way you live and the way you act, um, especially when you are on your highs, you know, has people, you know, it draws people closer to you and then they'll ask those questions, or you know, like, hey man, I, I, I noticed certain things about you and it brings people closer to God. And then the other thing that I wanted to um, uh, talk about was kind of goes into your lesson. Um, this is, it's coming from James uh, chapter one and it's verse uh, 19. And it's just, this is, this is just talking about, you know, the communication. I know you made some, uh, you made a comment about competing and you know, how, you know, husband and wife supposed to treat each other. But I, I do believe this is one of the like foundations, just really talking to anybody, but especially in your household, you know, that I had to, you know, uh, really, really take hold and, and, and actually make sure that I'm, I'm utilizing this properly. It says, wherefore, my, bre uh, my beloved brethren, in verse 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, 
and slow to wrath. And, and that's, that's so important because, you know, and I know everyone can relate. The moment your husband or the moment your wife open their mouth, you are already ready to respond to something, not even giving yourself the ability to understand what it is that they're trying to say, you know, and, and, and if you could take a step back and try to look, if we can all take a step back and try to look at things from the other person's point of view and, 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 and then actually say what it is that they said to you, the concerns or the things that they, they want to address, repeat it back to them so that way they could understand that, that you know what it is that they're saying and then you can address what it is that you want to say. But oftentimes we just, we're quick to respond and we're not truly hearing. So I just want to add that. Good lesson, brother. God bless you, Brother Kenny. Thank you for that, my brother. Appreciate that uh, that that input, my brother. Uh, brother Javier? Yes, a great comments, my, bro my brothers. I'm listening. Uh, listening in. I just wanted to uh, just tag, tag along with a question that was asked uh, concerning judgment. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it mentions, uh, is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, and so brother was going to log his brother and it was commanded concerning subjects like this to be able to judge between what is right and wrong. Should you take your, your own brother to, to court, which is wrong, which is a sin. Is there not anyone among you that can judge this simple matter? So when it comes to things like subjects like that, we are to judge. Um, and also concerning, you know, what the statement is made is bigger purpose a smaller purpose that statement comes from the world they have a measuring stick of their own that they try to use concerning what's the bigger purpose what's a, what's a smaller purpose and we know that uh whatever occupation you choose first Corinthians 731 is going to be used to disperse funds either for family either for yourself for your home for vehicles for movement first Corinthians 731 and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world, pass it away. And so whatever you have when it comes to uh, children, wife, uh, you have a home or bills, there's different things that you have to, you pay for. So whatever you possess or have, it has to be paid for. And whatever you occupation you, you get, uh, you pray that God bless you to, to be able to pay for it. And if you have children or, or if you have some bills, you know, you have to use wisdom concerning this life. And so, you know, bigger purpose or because I know billionaires, there's billionaires that die all the time and their purpose was not for God, you know. And so all their funds will never be seen again. They'll never see that money again. Uh, they are in a whole nother world. You know, they're in a whole nother place. If they weren't sealed, they would went into the fire. And so don't let the world... Uh, create an image of what's bigger, what's lesser, because the, the, the whole goal is to keep his commandments. And the money is just being used, and if it's used in a godly way for the church, for the saints, for the widows, for the ministry, for your, your children, for your house, uh, for your whatever bills that you have coming in. You know, because every person has a different uh, plate on their, on their table that they have to eat from. Everybody's uh, life is different in the church. And so everybody has different responsibilities uh, in the church. You know, some are single, some are, some are married, some have no kids, some have a lot of kids. And so when it comes to uh, that, you know, image that they create a bigger purpose, it's, it's mostly coming from a secular point. But if you desire, uh, let's say, more income coming in because you uh, desire to take care of your children, uh, then God sees that. God sees that and he opens doors for you to be able to have that to feed your kids or to be able to keep the lights on. So I just wanted to bring that up because God is involved in the world of the saints uh, uh, as well. And so, you know, that's that's the main goal. Thank you, Brother Javier. And another example there is Daniel, uh, Brother Sister Daniel 1.8. Uh, he's over in a foreign world, a foreign land. Uh, the Nebuchadnezzar uh, wants him to eat what they're eating. And as he changed their name and, and, and sent them to his school, but Daniel, the Bible says Daniel on eight, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
So he, knowing God's law, even though he was in a ungodly world, he still purposed to do the right thing. And by doing that, you know God exalted him, okay? And that's what we have to understand. You humble yourselves to follow God's purpose and want to serve God wherever you are, and God will exalt you in due time. Uh, Brother... you had made concerning Coach V's question about the zodiac signs and wonderful scriptures that you showed, you know, that that is witchcraft and that is sin and it's something that we shouldn't partake in. But especially in our world today that we live in, I mean, just the ridiculousness of it to where they're posting uh, um, news stories uh, about what type of soda you should drink according to your zodiac sign. You know, foolishness like that. And and, and, and and I see them, you know, when I'm reading the news, I see this stuff like every day and I'm like, my God, you know, so that just goes to show you how ridiculous it has gotten. It's already a sin and you shouldn't be practicing it. But for somebody to tell you, according to your zodiac sign, what type of soda you should drink. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So I just want to share that, you know, with the rest of the saints, you know, to let you know, please stay away from that stuff. I mean, don't even consider entertaining it because it's, it's just ridiculous. That's all I have, bro. God bless you. I didn't know that foolish was out there. Okay, uh, Brother Kennedy and then uh, Brother Adams. I accidentally left it up. Okay, my brother. Uh, brother, uh, brother Adams? Um, yeah, in, in respect to uh, Coach V's uh, uh, question, I think if you read Isaiah 47, um, God through Isaiah, or Holy Spirit through Isaiah, uh, writes about astrology. And he, he doesn't write about it in a, uh, in a positive vein. So I think the principle in, in that chapter, if you read through that, um, he's, he's not... <laughs> I'll let you read it, <laughs> but he's not, he's definitely not for it. He's definitely, I, I think you broke up on me. At least. Tell us that chapter again, book and chapter. Cause I didn't hear it though. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't have my earpiece hand. It's Isaiah chapter 47. I want to say it's around verse 13. That's okay. Isaiah 47. No, it's good. Okay. Isaiah 47. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. I didn't even hear the book or chapter. Isaiah 47. Talks and one about other it. quick. Yeah. Go ahead, my brother. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to share that with Brother B. If, if he would read that, maybe that might help in regards to his question. And then uh, with respect to um, Alexandra's question, uh, 1 Timothy 5, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think anyone mentioned this verse, but verse 8, verse, verse 8 says, but if any provide not for his own, okay, so that's for yourself. Because then he goes on and says, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith, and it's worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. So uh, I think the principle in that scripture is, I know that this is talking about widows, um, but I think in terms of us working, God expects us to work to provide for ourselves. That's the own. And then, of course, he adds to that uh, for our own house, which would then be our families. Um, and if we don't do that, I mean, the Bible says that then we deny the faith. So we are trusting in him. So just wanted to add that to what the scriptures have already been given. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you, Brother Adams. Any other Bible questions? Any other questions? Comments? All right, saints. Thank you all so much for these kingdom studies. I really do appreciate it. All the input and the edification and exhortation that we received on tonight. We're going to have a closing prayer. Are there any uh, prayer requests? I want to give some good news. My wife's real. test results came out good for those of you who were praying for her uh, yesterday on the Zoom. We asked prayer, uh, and so everything came out positive. So we're thanking God uh, for that. I appreciate all y'all's prayers on her behalf. Are there any other prayer requests? Any other Amen. prayer? Yeah. yeah, thank you all. Yeah, I have yes. a prayer request for me. Oh, okay, Sister Vera. Wait, my sister. 
Okay, so Severe, we're gonna keep her in prayer. Okay, anybody else? Sister anybody? Sister Claudia. Okay, Sister Claudia, yeah, Sister Claudia, we're gonna keep her in prayer. Uh, Sister Claudia, the uh, saint over at the Goose Street Church of Christ. Okay, we're gonna keep her in prayer. Uh, anyone else? Oh, um, I just have a prayer request for my dad. He's just been battling like really bad anxiety and it's like causing his blood pressure and stuff to go up. So just pray for him. Mm -hmm. God bless you, sis. We definitely will. Keep us Alexandra's father uh, in prayers and his health condition, okay? Uh, anyone else, saints? Any other one else? Okay, if you're on here, you're not a member of the body of Christ. Again, let me just give you the plan of salvation. Now, you know, none of these lessons will get you into heaven unless you've obeyed the gospel. you got to be born again. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people do. Please understand that. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people do. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And anybody who makes it to heaven hearing the gospel must have have repented and obeyed the gospel, okay? And so God wants to give you his spirit. You know, right now, if you don't have God's spirit, you're still fighting in your own power, in your own strength. You know, I don't know why people say, once I get my life together, then I'll come to God or I'll come to church. Impossible. If you could get yourself together without God, without the spirit, then the father would need to send his son. You know, why would you even, would need God? So you need God, okay? You need to be born again. Uh, you need to hear the gospel, hear that Jesus died, buried, and he rose on the third day for you. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, so then now faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. You're not saved just because you hear the gospel. you got to believe that. Hebrews 11 and 6, God says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For you that come to him must believe that he is, and that he is the word of them that diligently come him. So you got to believe that Jesus died for your sin, that you're a sinner, and then repent. Repent is a change of mind, which leads to a change of action. You understand you're a sinner, you haven't been worshiping right, uh, haven't been living right. Uh, you've fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and in verse 5, I tell you, nay, unless you all likewise repent, he says you're going to all likewise perish. Again, good people don't go to heaven, saved people do. And then you need to confess that you believe Jesus died for you, that he is the son of God, uh, that salvation is in no other name but the name of Jesus. You cannot be ashamed of Jesus Christ. you got to confess that he is the son of God. He is the way to the Father. Jesus in Matthew 10 and verse 32 and 33, he said, Whosoever acknowledges me before men, he says, I'll acknowledge him before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever disowns me before men, he says, I'll disown him before my Father, which is in heaven. So all you do is make that confession and not your sins. Uh, there's nothing you can tell us that you've done that is so bad that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cover. I don't care what you've done. There is absolutely no sin you've committed. That if you confess Jesus as Lord, you believe he's the son of God, that if you get baptized in water for the remission of your sin, that it cannot wash away. And that is the culminating act that will put you into the body of Christ. You need to be baptized into Christ where you put on Christ, where Christ who is alive gives you the indwelling of the spirit. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he preached the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All those Jews that were there on that day who were actually there had a hand in nailing him to that cross. When they heard that message, they believed, and they asked Peter and the apostles, what shall we do? They want to know, what do we need to do to be saved? And the same thing Peter told them on that day, over 2,000 years ago, is the same thing everybody must obey today. He said, you need to repent, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, he tells them why. It's for the remission of your sins. And what will happen? You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, you're not a his. Romans 8 9. You must have God's Spirit. And that Spirit is received. He is received. You get into the watery grave of baptism. Acts 2 47, 3,000 people got baptized. And praising God, having faith with all the people, the Lord added to the people of God on that day. And we'll baptize you. We'll put somebody in your position as much as is in us tonight to get you into the water. That's how serious it is. We baptize on any day that ends with why. Okay? Make sure you get that. No matter what time of night it is, understand that is the plan that must be obeyed. You got to be taught right to be baptized right. And you can have your soul saved tonight. Okay? And so we can assist you in that area. Whoever invited you to this Zoom, give them a call. I'll give you my number. Give me a call, 281-965-4875. And we'll do all that we can to make sure, that, that all in our power, uh, to get you uh, in the body of Christ on tonight, okay? Uh, at this time, we're going to close out with a prayer. Uh, if you don't mind, pray with me. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you again for these Kingdom Family Studies. I thank you for every soul on here tonight. Pray, Father, that the questions that were asked, that the answer we received was one from God. Father, from your word. Father, we heard all the various requests. You heard those who are dealing with sickness, those who are dealing with suffering in their body. Uh, Father God, we just want to lift them up to you. 
I'm not informing you of anything. You know everything to God. You know every supplication. You created us all. And so, Father, you hear our hearts, and we know you love us. And, Father, we know that you're able to do it exceedingly above what we ask or even think. So, Father, the various requests tonight we ask that, Father, you answer according to our will, but most of all, according to your will, because we want your purpose done and fulfilled in our life. And, Father, if you don't uh, answer according to our desire, I pray that we understand our desire should be that your will is done, and we accept that. And, dear God, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, dear God. Thank you for life. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to straighten up whatever things we have crooked in our life. And, Father, I just pray all of us will be better husbands, wives, and parents, dear God, that will have godly homes that represent the image of reconciliation, which is what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. And, Father, thank you for the praise reports. Father, for answering the prayers, Father, according to our desire. Those who are sick, who are healed. Those, Father, who are looking for tests to come out, Father, in a, in a good way. Father, you've answered that. And we say thank you. You are worthy to be praised. And we glorify your name. We love you, Father. Now may the grace of God and speak in your Holy Spirit. Rest will abide with us all is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, Saints. Remember, next time we'll have uh, a Thursday on Brother Green's Zoom page at six at 7 o'clock. Forgive me, on Thursday. Study Luke 15, a very wonderful chapter. Luke 15. Uh, love y'all. Y'all have a great night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.